Hi, everyone. Welcome to a Channel 781 News special report about an issue that came up in Waltham that we first learned about uh, in last week's school committee meeting, which is an attempt to ban some books in our school library. Um, last week at the school committee meeting, at the beginning of the meeting, there's a public comment period. And Renee Arena, who ran for school committee last year but didn't end up winning a seat, um, started to make comments where she said she had uh, some concerns about some books in the school. And she mentioned one book called Gender Queer. And she was cut off and she was told that the public comments have to be about something on the agenda and this wasn't on the agenda. So she didn't end up um, finishing what she was saying. Uh, but we later learned that a formal complaint has been submitted to Waltham High School um, about two books. One of them is called Gender Queer by Maya Kobabe. It's a graphic novel and it's a, a memoir of the author who's non-binary. It came out only in 2019, but it's already been controversial in a lot of communities around the US um, on the grounds that uh, some of the drawings in it are pornographic or obscene or not age appropriate. And in fact, back in December, NBC News called it one of the most banned books in America. Um, this book is Gay by Juno Dawson is not quite as well known, but it's also been controversial in some communities. It's a book with cartoon type drawings and it's sort of a self-help book for teenagers who think they might be gay and are just looking for basic information on what that means. Um, so because a uh, formal uh, complaint has been submitted to the school, they need to commit uh, they need to convene a committee to review it, and we know that the committee will include a parent and a librarian and the principal and I believe two or three other school officials. Um, we also that since this happened, uh, starting next Tuesday, this issue is going to be on the agenda of the school committee under um, old business. So the school committee may not be discussing it, but that means people can bring it up in the public input. And so after um, Mrs. Arena tried to make her comment at the last meeting, some of um, her supporters online were upset because they felt that she had been censored. So there is a good chance that they're going to come back and bring this up in the school committee meeting again. Um, so we wanted to get some background on this book and the issue um, the issues surrounding it. Uh, so we have some awesome guests to help us out. I'm here with Chris Gamble. Hello, thanks for having me. And you know Chris Gamble and I as hosts of Channel 781 News, but uh, I should probably also mention that last year we were co-organizers of the first ever, as far as we know, Waltham Pride event. Um, we also have Maria Varmazas. Hello. Who is an award-winning comment, uh, Sorry, let me get my notes. Cartoonist. I Cartoon <laughs> I'm a cartoonist. <laughs> Comics artist, memoirist, and illustrator. And your most recent book is called Extraordinary Times. Is that right? I meant to ask you that before. Yes, that's right. Yeah. right. Thank you. Um, who's based here in Waltham, is an also very active in our local art scene and an organizer of Waltham Open Studios. We also have Katie Cohen. Hello. And Katie is one of the people behind the Little Queer Library. Um, and we have Jessica Arasetti. Hello. Jessica is a senior at Waltham High School and a member of the GSA. And uh, before I um, start asking you some questions, I, uh, one additional part of the story I should mention is also last week, the Little Queer Library, which is one of the free outdoor libraries you've probably seen around in Waltham, had an unusual number of books taken. Um, it's not unusual for people to take books because it is a free library, but it seemed like a lot were taken at once. And we don't know if that is related to what's going on um, with the complaint about these books at the school, but we thought it might be. So that's part of the reason we have Katie on tonight um, to hear more about that. Um, but before that, I want to go to Maria because I'm looking for some very basic background information because uh, a lot of people watching may be very familiar with graphic novels or not familiar at all. So can you just tell us a little bit about graphic novels and who reads them? Are they more for kids? Are they more for adults? Um, Great questions. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start, I'll be quick, but I'll give a really high level overview. 
Graphic novels are a way of saying comics or comic books. It's just a fancier way of saying it. Uh, I draw comic books slash cartoons slash graphic novels, whatever you want to call them. Um, it, a lot of people think of comic books as just like Batman, Superman, stuff in capes. But the reality is nowadays, the vast majority and the exponential growth of market share for comic books is actually manga, which are Japanese comics translated into English, or graphic novels, which can be any genre you can imagine, because comics are a medium, not a genre. Superhero, com superhero comic books are declining very quickly in terms of their market share. So they're actually not the majority of what people are reading, uh, although a lot of people still do read them. Um, and as for who reads graphic novels, the one of the biggest segments for graphic novels is actually youth. So not young adults, which would be categorized for 12 to 18 year olds but actually young kids so the books we're talking about tonight are not for those kids um but uh, like elementary school age kids to middle middle grade or middle school kids that's where like a humongous amount of graphic novel sales are made so there is a market that is growing very quickly for young adults 12 to 18 year olds that is where gender queer comes in um but that is actually much smaller than uh, youth and middle grade graphic novels right now thank you you're welcome. So, <laughs> so um, a lot of people are first hearing about genderqueer in regard to this controversy, um, but can you give us from a different point of view of somebody who has other reasons to be interested in it, can you tell us a little bit more about who is Maya Kobabe and, and what is genderqueer about? Yeah, Maya Kobabe is an incredible cartoonist who um, has studied uh, from some of the best graphic memoirist in the business, frankly, named Mari Naomi, which is one, who's one of my favorite uh, cartoonists. Um, E's work is extremely personal, uh, leaves pretty much no stone unturned, and has been publishing his work on Instagram for, I want to say several years, because Genderqueer came out in 2019, and he, pardon me, he continues to published work on Instagram. And I think one of the things that genderqueer made waves in was that it came out at a time where a lot of people were asking a lot of the questions that are sort of addressed in genderqueer, um, but also that Kobabe's work really is so personal and um, so eloquently stated and so sensitive also. There are no easy answers in Kobabe's work. There are a lot of complicated questions that are raised, a lot of controversial things that he addresses that are not like blithely set aside. And I think that's why Kobabe's work continues to resonate with so many people and why Kobabe is one of probably the best cartoonists of our day right now. Thank you. So uh, I'll, let's go to Jessica. Jessica, have, were you familiar uh, with this book before this controversy came up? Hi, yes, um, I was. I was made aware of the book um, in November of last year because my librarian asked me to read it because it was coming under question. And what did you think? I thought it was amazing. Um, I personally uh, couldn't relate to their uh, to his experience of like gender exploration, but I found that it was beautifully illustrated. Um, that it had a lot of really valuable metaphors and information for young LGBT students and young adults. Um, and I just found it a very valuable read. And unfortunately, I haven't had time to go back and read it a second time. But when I took notes on it, I remarked on how I found myself thinking about it when I wasn't reading it and thinking about it deeply and like almost in a philosophical way. So I thought it was just fantastic. That's great. So we've heard a lot about why it's a really great, impressive book. But why does it need to be in the school library? Why is it important for it to be there? I think it has a lot of important firsthand resources for people who are right at the age range of questioning their gender identity. And unfortunately, the school curriculum, um, the health curriculum is very minimal. And the classes, the health class where students would be learning about how to safely explore their own gender don't address it. And I think having this book in the library and more importantly, making students aware that it's in the library is a very good way to account for this gap in our education. A lot of people um, have seen selected pictures from this book um, on social media or on TV. 
And to them, it's shocking what they're seeing, but they're not necessarily in the school library very often. They don't necessarily know what else is there. So how do you think the content in this book compares to other things that are available in the high school library? Um, I think it's, you know, fairly tame. Um, the scenes I'm sure they were referring to were few and far between, but more importantly, they weren't anything that students wouldn't be experiencing or otherwise learning about. Um, and the kind of discomfort that I think those scenes cause is not unique to genderqueer. And it's inherent in a lot of similar books that talk about important topics that young adults need to know about as they become part of our society. Thank you. And how does it, you, you kind of hinted at this a little, but you know, a lot of people talking about this, maybe we're in school at a time where we didn't have the internet. So how does the content in this book compare to what someone might find if they went online looking for similar kinds of information? I think it's a really good middle ground between, you know, full out information with no censorship or mod moderation of any kind and a complete ignoring of this content because it comes from a firsthand source. It's qualified as young adult. Um, and while it's not intended necessarily to teach, it, it definitely has an aspect of intending for readers to be able to relate to it. And it gives students a way to know how they can safely explore parts of their identity, um, maybe by reaching out to other sources, but the important part is it opens the door for that. Thank you. And we'll move on to Katie. Um, so I mentioned Little Queer Library, some people probably familiar with it and some people were probably like, wait, what? So can you give us a little bit of background? What is your library and, and why did you decide to create it? Yeah, so um, the Little Queer Library is a little free library that's focused on queer books. So if you don't know what a little free library is, um, it's an outdoor um, little box type of thing um, that people can drop off books there that they want to share with other people in the community. And people can also go and grab books for free. So it's a really great way to be able to um, read different types of books. Our library is set up so that we are focusing on um, books that are by and about LGBT plus queer uh, people and issues. Um, so we're really trying to be able to give more diverse books out into the Waltham community. Um, a lot of queer literature can be really hard to find and it can be really expensive to get good quality um, books that have really positive representation or um, just are from a different perspective. Um, it's really hard to be able to find them. I wish that when I was growing up, I had a resource like what I have out there for everybody else. Um, that's one of the things that we try to do is try to be a resource for people and the reason that we started it is um, actually when I first started, it was going to be a regular free little library with a couple of queer books in there because that was important to me. And those books were actually super popular. We got a whole bunch of people who were very excited that this existed. And um, we got thank you letters in the mail. Um, we got people who were dropping off books and just super excited about the whole thing. And that showed me and my wife who helps me out um, that we really, this was a need within the community. This was something that people wanted um, and we needed to be this type of resource. So in more recent times um, after we got started, um, we have focused really on providing queer literature that spans the breadth of what it means to be an LGBT person living in the world. Um, so that's really kind of our mission is to provide those books to the community. 
So when you say queer literature, does that mean it's all books for adults or do you have kids books as well? We have books for everyone. Um, so we have books all the way from uh, toddlers. So board books where it's talking about, oh, isn't it great that I have two moms? Um, so we have board books all the way from there, all the way up into adult literature. We have a lot of YA books. Um, we have uh, graphic novels that come in. Um, there's history books. There's a whole bunch of different types of books that are out there for anybody who likes reading, really. Um, and that's what we want to provide. It's not just for the LGBT community. It's great that it's there and it's great to have that representation but it's also important to have it available to everybody. So now that we know more about uh, what is usually going on with you, can you tell us what happened last week? Yeah, um, so unfortunately, we had somebody who came and stopped at our library and took about 15 to 20 books from the library, which is highly unusual. Normally people will take a couple and leave a couple um, but the books that were taken were all ones that had just recently been uh, donated to us. So they were brand new books. All of them were visibly queer titles. So they had gay in the title, they had trans in the title, they had something like that that showed that they were queer books. Um, anything else that was kind of subtly queer or was something that was donated that wasn't a queer book, um, was not things that were taken. So at first we thought that it was somebody who was taking them to resell them. Um, my post online that I made about it for our Facebook group and also our Instagram account um, said as much, but as we've learned more about what's happening in the broader community and thinking more about the books that were actually taken, it feels a little bit more like somebody who's trying to censor us and trying to take these books away and not have them in the hands of the people who need them. Um, so it really does seem like it's more within that vein. You mentioned you posted about it on social media. What has the response been? It's been amazing. Um, it's been a crazy week at our house. Uh, we've had a whole bunch of donations of people who have come and knocked on our door and given us money to help replace our books. Um, we've had so many people who have been mailing books to us. Um, we've had so many people who have reached out through both of our social media platforms and have just said that they're so sorry this happened and that they're so excited to know that this library exists. Um, the positive thing to come out of it is that a lot more people know that we're a resource for them. Um, and we've actually gotten more donations of books than what we originally lost. So now we have a lot more books that are available for everybody and a lot more for us to be able to offer people, which is awesome. Can you just say a little bit more? It seems like you were, you were very clear that the books uh, in your library are for all ages. Why is that important? Why, why, do you, why is it important to have books out there for kids or teenagers? I think it's, it's extremely important because it's important to be able to see yourself in literature. Um, it's a powerful experience. Um, I personally, I identify as bisexual. And when I was growing up, there was really nothing that was something um, that I saw as representation where a character was bi um, and it wasn't a big deal. And it always made me sad and like something was maybe wrong with me that I didn't have this reflection. And I remember there was um, in the book Graceling, there was a throwaway line for a character who um, they mentioned that she was dating a guy now and she used to have dated a girl. And it was just a throwaway line and nobody made a big deal about it. And it was the first time that I ever saw a positive um, thing where it wasn't a big deal. It wasn't the whole main story of that. And I got so excited that I told all of my friends 
<laughs> it was literally a couple of words and it meant so much to me. And having that powerful experience, I want to be able to provide that for other people. Um, and it's not only people who are in the community, even though that's really important. It's also important for people who are not um, LGBT, who don't identify as queer, to be able to read these stories of people who are different than them. Because they, um, if you read things that are about people who are different than you, then you end up understanding that person. And you end up embodying what it's like to be that person. And that can be a way for you to understand a little bit more and to be more accepting. And I think that that's really important. Um, it's an important resource for people and it's an important process for people who are coming out and trying to figure out things about themselves and for people who are just trying to understand what it's like to be another person. Thank you. Jessica, let me actually ask you a follow-up on that. Uh, we're all, we, I can definitely relate to that experience of reading what seemed like a throwaway line in a book and say, having it be a big deal. Do you think that um, that still happens to high school students today or is, is everybody so sophisticated that we don't need that anymore? No, I, I, a single throwaway line is honestly all that I need to start reading a book. Um, uh, my friends and I, a lot of times we exchange books, uh, very, very much so based off of like, I know you were looking for a book with like more gay characters in it. This doesn't have a ton of it, but it has something and maybe you can find more from here. So I, I, I relate to that experience so much. Thanks. I'm going to go back to Chris now because I understand we might have some breaking news <laughs> that the, the school uh, the school already announced the decision about the book. Is that right? Well, yeah. I mean, I just saw an hour ago um, the um, the book committee made their decision on the two books, and I'm going to. I'll put it in the chat what they decided to do, but um, it doesn't mean that what you said isn't true. It is still going to be part of the docket um, for February 16th. The book committee did advise, and I think they just, I don't think the school committee decides this. I think they decided and it's now going to happen. Um, content advisories about the mature content will be added to the front inside covers of both of the books. Um, the second edition of this book is gay will be purchased and replaced uh, and will replace um, the 2015 version, which it currently has. Um, and the language updated is to be more inclusive, update statistics and source citations, uh, has the author's information updated to reflect her transition. Um, and additional resources will be added to the inside back cover of Genderqueer. So that is going to happen. And they, they just want to see that as a compromise between um, taking it off the shelves and doing nothing. Um, so I'm curious if anyone in this panel has any comments about that. Um, I certainly agree with the content advisories. Um, I suggested, uh, especially for Genderqueer, to my librarian when I read it, um, that if there was concerns about students having and like reading something that was just distressing to them then just let them know ahead of time absolutely um so uh this has all been great content and i love this conversation um i think something that's been missing is just uh um, i'm curious just how this uh you know how this all of this how does this make you feel uh, like Josh and Katie? Sorry, Maria and Jessica, I don't know you as well as these other two folk, uh, but I mean, for two very visibly, very out uh, Walthamites, I mean, this has, been, this has been going on for a while in Waltham. I mean, I remember from all my travels with the city council, the current head of the um, Republican city committee coming into the city council. And I wanna quote him, his name is Jim Dixon. Well, this was in 2019. 
that our schools are now encouraging our children to explore their sexualities in ways that are strange and harmful. Uh, so like this whole schooling and, you know, indoctrination thing, it's nothing new, but it is trending right now. So I am curious, you know, how is, how does this, you know, as like an out Walthamite, as a visibly out Walthamite, you know, how's that, how's that feeling for you in this moment? Uh, do you want to go first, Katie? Yeah, sure. Um, it's been hard in certain ways. Uh, it's hard to always be the person that is rallying for things um, and to be the person that is uh, continuing to fight. Um, I think the good stuff that's come out of this at least recently, is that um, it's felt more like, at least from us, from the amount of support that we've gotten for what happened to our library, um, it's felt like there's more people who support us out there than don't support us or want to censor us. Um, and that's been really uplifting in a lot of ways. Um, so I think it's definitely it's hard to be in that space, but it's also really empowering in a lot of ways as well. Yeah, Chris, I'm glad you asked that because I think that even though we just found out that the committee has made a decision on this, I think that there is still gonna be a lot of people who want a school committee meeting um, to respond to Mrs. Arena if she's there and yeah I've been thinking about this a lot um, and I think a lot of people in town have and um, it's not shocking that there were people who have these attitudes I mean you know they're the same people I grew up with I don't expect they changed <laughs> that much but um, it's the reason I, I, I think there are probably also other people who are saying wait a minute okay well it's ridiculous that she wanted to ban this book but why why are people so upset about it she's just you know what and the reason I think is so I'm it's really personal for a lot of people um, it's not just political and so for example I'm an uncle and uh, that's a big part of my life and I have two nephews who are my brother's kids and I have a nephew and niece who are my husband's sister's kids and when I was a kid in the 80s that was very rare openly gay and lesbian people did not get to be uncles and aunts and even if your family was accepting of you once kids came into the picture, then it would be assumed that you weren't going to talk about anything gay in front of the kids. And that meant you couldn't introduce them to your partner unless you said they were your roommate or something. And that meant that person could never be a part of the family. And the reason that happened, even among relatively accepting people, was because there was this belief that if you talk about anything gay in front of kids, you're talking about a kinky sex practice and you're introducing them to some ideas they're not ready for and they're immediately going to start asking questions embarrassing questions about you know what it, well how does that work in the bedroom which of course kids never care about only adults care about that um but because of that belief because of people saying i don't have a problem with it you being queer i have a problem with you introducing kids to something they're not ready for yet that had a huge impact on people's lives and what was possible for them in terms of being part of their family. And so that's why it's, uh, and I think what we're seeing now is all the same things that we, people were saying about gays and lesbians in the 90s, they're saying about trans and non-binary and every other category of queer people now. And um, it's very personal because it's the same stuff that the rest of us were hearing 20, 30 years ago and we're sick of it. So I think that um, that's why for Mrs. Arena to bring this up in the school committee, even though it was a very brief comment, it came across as an expression of bigotry. And I think an expression of bigotry made in public needs to be addressed in public. And so I hope a lot of people are there to, to address it at the meeting um, if she's also there. And I and I think it will be addressed. And I think that um, I think that's what it comes down to is, is, you know, I keep coming back to just like it comes down to organizing. And through all my travels in Waltham, I actually there's a lot more queer folk 
in Waltham than I than I thought initially when I moved here. Uh, but the problem is that we're not organized enough. We're not, uh, you know, there's not enough resources. And uh, this, and you know, what we're talking about here is good for that. Um, but I mean, Waltham is home is a home for a nationally recognized hate group that uh, centers around traditional family values. Um, you know, I brought up the leader of the RCC. Uh, and so, you know, they're organized and they're only becoming more organized. Um, and so it just, I think, is going to require us organizing as well, because it doesn't take a majority of anybody to push anything. It just requires people to be organized. Um, and it can be a very small population of people to do that too, um, to get anything they desire. Um, and so what I'm trying to say is that, uh, that I hope our work with Queer Waltham and I hope our work um, in other avenues gets people more organized, gets people to uh, realize that next, is it next Wednesday? Yeah, next Wednesday is a school committee meeting where there will be bigotry shown. And so it is you know, our duty to come to that meeting and show support um, and just make sure we as a community come together. I agree. Thank you, Chris. Any other final thoughts from anyone? Thank you so much, everyone. I think you, all three of you, all four of you, including Chris, have given us a really good insight and background on why this issue is important and hopefully fill in people who are only hearing about it as a controversy and, and have some background on it. And we'll look forward to seeing what happens at the committee meeting next week, sure. Thank you, everybody.